honestly, I will love it if we beat them. Yes, everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Warm Down today. Delighted to be joined by Manchester City legend, uh, Sean Go. Uh, Sean, thank you for joining us. Oh, it's a pleasure. Before we get into this, uh, this is brought to you guys by the good folks at The Athletic, and the link for that is in the description. If you want 50% off your annual subscription and a month's free trial, then check it out down below. And we're talking about one of their articles in a little bit. Um, but Sean, obviously you're a Manchester City legend, and I have to say thank you for coming, because I'm sure you would have found something else to do today after than coming after the derby. Defense. Yes, there's a lot of things I could have done, like burying my head in the, in the sand. <laughs> um yeah, always, always uh, happy to come by and, and ha- have a chat, certainly, yeah. Right, so I wanted to, to get Sean on because there's, there's an aspect of Sean's career that I don't think many people know. Loads of people recognise you from the Premier League era, obviously very successful against United yourself particularly, mm-hmm. sadly. Um, but you did actually start your footballing career at Manchester United, didn't you? Not a lot of people know that. Yes. Um, it, United uh, went to Bermuda on a mid-season break uh, w- over there in Bermuda, and that's when Sir Alex Ferguson had scouted me, uh, offered me trials. I had played um, played a couple games, scored a goal. Um, he had then offered me a contract, so really excited. Um, first Bermudian to sort of make it professionally since uh, Clyde passed, so I was, I was over the moon and, and, and buzzing about that. But yeah, that's that's how I initially started. Yeah, do you remember what he said to you when he offered you a trial? Because it must have been a random one, not to be getting picked up on a mid-season tour. Yeah, it, it's funny because it took ages for my work permit. At the time, I needed to get a work permit because at the time I had, I think it was nineteen international caps, and you needed to have twenty because essentially I was coming here taking, um, I was taking a job of, a, of an English kid, uh, so I needed to have played another another game. So. A game was arranged, but it took something like uh, seven, eight months for it to actually come through. So wow. although I was uh, playing, I was essentially like um, a youth kid. I wasn't, I wasn't on an actual contract. You know, I was, I was sort of getting, um, it was like 40 pounds or something like that. Yeah. Um, but when you, when you really won it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't even about that. Yes, I wanted the, the actual contract to get sorted. Um, but... Yeah, I was, I was just happy to be a professional player. Um, what do you think about when you think about that time at Manchester United? Because we just had a, ch- a chat in there and you, you felt like you weren't good enough for United at the time. Yeah, I mean, at, at the time I thought I was. You know, you, when you're an 18-year-old and, you know, you, you think, yeah, you're good enough, you, you just want the chance, the opportunity. Uh, when I look back, I, I know that I wasn't. Um, I, you know, I was still learning the game, adjusting to the game. Um at the time, Mark Hughes, Brian McClure, these guys played, you know, if there were 60 games in a season, they played all 60. It wasn't too often, you know, they didn't play games. Um, so it was a really tough time. And then after the Donahue was uh, Mark Robbins. Um, then it was another lad, Daniel Graham, who was a striker. Then it was myself. So I think even if he had fallen that far down in terms of, you know, pulling myself to, to, to play, I think he would have used um, someone like Lee Sharp, who I was in digs with, and probably played someone like him up the middle. So, um, yeah. But at the time, they were calling for us, Alex, ahead, because um, United wasn't doing so well. Mm. Um, and as a kid, you're like, yeah, yeah, sack him, you know, because you, you, I wanted that chance. Like, yeah, get rid of Sir Alex Ferguson. Get a new manager and he'll see my ability. <laughs> Yeah. When when the time came to leave United, um, what did that feel? Did that feel like a failure or did it feel like an opportunity to actually get some games? Well, I didn't want to be uh, seen as a failure because, again, having come from Bermuda and not not essentially made it, I was prepared to go lower down. And the story is funny because Alex Ferguson called me in the office and says, look, you know, uh, you've done well, but you, you're not, you know, you're not going to be a part of my plans. You're, you're a bit down in packing order. Uh, but we've done a deal with Rotherham. So I was like, oh, okay. All right. So you don't so, even get asked. You just you basically like, hey, by the way, you're off in a bit. Yeah, that, that's how it was, essentially. Um, didn't have too much of the, the agents at that time. So you you as a, as an individual were sort of negotiating yourself. Um, but from how I was seeing it was, okay, if I need to go down a, a level or two, then I need to. Um, I remember going home and I remember thinking, right, let's have a look. Where's Rotherham? <laughs> and, I, I, and, I, and, and the thing is, I think what players think, you know, in League Two, League One, uh, and even in Championship, they think, 
you know, everyone is so aware of what they're doing and, and how they're doing. And when you're when you sort of in a Premier League club, no no one knows you, knows what you're doing. Um, they're just, they're not really bothered because you're not in, in the Premier League. So I remember going home looking and thinking, where's Rotherham? Rotherham. Uh, first of all, looking at it on a map because I had no idea where it was. And I said, oh, okay, it's an hour and a bit from where I currently am. Not not too bad. Um, but then going down the leagues, it was like, right, okay, championship. I was going down. Said, no, no, Rotherham, no. <laughs> I said, okay. So I was like, do- had a double check, you know. Then I was like, League One. I was like, all right, so have a look. No. It's like, oh, hold on, hold on. Let me go check back in the Premier. <laughs> Are they not there? And in the end, it was like League Two. And it was, it was like, that's when it was like, wow. Like, I, I had to, that was the offer that was there that the club had done. Um, but I, again, it was either go back to Bermuda, being an amateur player or, you know, start over and build my way back up. So it was, it was hard pill to swallow. Um, but it was something I I had no other choice for me. I I saw it as that that's my ground zero to work from. What was the career option in Bermuda? Just play amateur and just play amateur. Yeah. And players, you know, it's like Sunday league guys, you have your job and you play on Sunday for, for your bit of, um, you know, exercise, enjoyment, and laughter. And, you know, it, in Bermuda, it's pretty much the same. It's, that was where I got the joy, enjoyed it. Um, but it was nothing really more than that, other than play for the national team. Uh, and, and that was it. Was you the only professional player in the, amateur, in the national team as well? Well, there, at the time, I... In the time of 88, uh, in England, yes. Uh, a lad named Kyle Lightbourne came over in 92, and he played for Walsall, then to go on to Coventry when they was in the Premier, and then uh, went to Stoke um, when they were in Championship. So then, uh, that's about three, four years after I'd been there. Uh, and then we've had one or two that, that sort of, got into professional teams but didn't really kick on and, and now currently Naki Wiles is, is the flag bearer for Bermuda. But you was the only professional apart from uh, Lightbourne that came over but at the time when you was playing for Bermuda you was literally the only professional player everyone else was an amateur. Yeah and and it was it was weird because you know you started having certain routines and understandings I, I certainly remember later later in my time of playing I'd go back home for a national game international game and I don't know, we, we're playing one of the other Caribbean islands and, you know, pre-match meal would be whatever you wanted. So you, you'd be in your hotel and guys be ordering like cheeseburgers and <laughs> fries. And, and I would just smile because I would just think, this is, this is not right. This is not what, what you do. But again, I didn't want to go and say, look, guys, this isn't right. This is because they'll be like, Oh, you've changed now. You <laughs> ate you ate burgers back in the day now. No burgers ain't good for you. So um but now the, the program is set up proper, um, with the nutrition and everything. But back then I remember I remember sort of seeing players eat cheeseburgers and all this sort of stuff for pre match and and I remember asking the guy, I said, Can I just get like a bit of grilled chicken and a bit of pasta and, and the guy looked at me like, You are <laughs> you you are so Little, little funny little, little situations there, yeah. What do you think changed in your game um, at Rotherham to enable you to get back into like a Premier League team? I think that it just, one, I, I learned, you know, everyone played 4 4 too. So I sort of understood and learned the game, you know. Every club you went to, every manager that you listened to, that did interviews, you know, they had the same sort of, Philosophy, and that was you know one shot, one in behind in terms of strikers linking up together, partnering together, getting yourselves in the box, get across the near post, and all you know it was generally the same sort of stuff. And once I started to understand that, uh, along with with my pace, because I wasn't an aggressive player, um, I'd like to think of myself was more uh, thinking and knowing about the game. So how can how can I outsmart you to to get to the near post? You know, or or sometimes. You know, I used to do things like shout at a level that I'm going near post, knowing that the cross on the ball, I'm taking a gamble that he's going to hit it far, but I would say near, but only you could hear me say near. So therefore, you're trying to beat me near post and I'm faded far. So it's this, you know, it's just little things that, that you get top players do that the, the lower level players don't do. 
Um, but you learned it from being around around quality as well. Uh, Joe Royal, it was that took you to Manchester City. Uh, when you joined City, they were Division One, just about to hit Division Two, wasn't they? Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, the old. Division. It was like cha- Championship going on to League to League One, and it, it was tough because I actually had moved from a, a club or a team, Bristol City, who was who done really well, who actually got promoted from League One to to Championship. So, so we sort of done a crossover. Um, and I remember I left a team that was full of confidence, playing fluid football, players interchanging. Uh, not, not a lot of interchanging, but players knew the rules, and you know wingers were, were delivering crosses, and, and it just it just all worked. And I, and I went to to uh, Man City, and there was no confidence. It was it it was just a real eye opener. Like wow, thirty thousand, thirty thirty four thousand coming to these games. And it, what, was that, what year was that? Ninety seven, ninety eight. Uh, when you joined City? 1996. Uh, sorry, 98, sorry. 98. I went to Bristol City in 96, 98. 98, I was at, at Man City. But the confidence was just um, not there. And and it, it actually got so bad that we would get on a minibus, uh, go to a local school, which was only sort of 200 yards away, warm up in a gym, and then come on the field, just put your boots on, and the game would start. So we, when we walked out before the, you know, before the fans were there and everything, we'd walk out and see what boot and we, you know, footwear we need. Um, but that's how bad it got that we were getting booed and hammered in a warm up. Um, I remember times, you know, filing a player and and our, you know, city fans would go off, off, off. So that's how bad it got because for city fans it was like, we don't, we, what are we doing here? What are we doing this low? Um, so yeah, it was it was a tough time. Is that even possible? I mean, this well, is what a, are you I, thinking? Is that possible for United? No, for United to be there? No, <laughs> I fucking I hope not. <clears throat> is it possible for you to imagine what the club has become now from from those days when you joined? Yeah, that. Well, um, I think the, the 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 dreams and the hopes at that time was could we could we consistently be a top six team? I mean, when I was there, the, the top finish we had was was ninth. And and I think the aspirations was, can we consistently be a top was six? That under, was that um, Keegan or Spencer? That was Keegan. Um, that was under Kevin Keegan. So, you know, it was having finished ninth, I know the, 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 the feeling, you know, among certainly the fans would have been, okay, we now need to start being a top six. Uh, and, and what that meant... You know, yes, some better quality players, but just being consistent to be up there. Um, and so when I look at today, no, I didn't foresee world-class players, you know, uh, uh, magnificent facilities for the academy and, and everything. I, I did not foresee that at all. Did you still train at Platte Lane when you were there? Yes, you used to train at um, Platt Lane. And in fact, I'm not sure if they were United fans, but we used to have fans that used to come and watch us warm up. And we used to do shooting practice and, and they be, be watching and be stood there behind the fence saying, you're rubbish, you're Platt crap. Lane's on the main road, isn't it? Yeah. For, for those who don't know, Platt Lane's literally like any leisure centre in any town yes. with, a, with a chain link fence yeah. that anyone can just walk past. You walk past, exactly. So there used to be people that come and watch you know, I don't know, on a lunch break or just to stop by. And I used to think, are, are these City fans? <laughs> because why would you come, spend your time, stand on the fence, watch while you're having a bit of lunch or whatever, and just be abusing, <laughs> abusing players? Like, you're rubbish, you're useless. And I'm just thinking. So we, we had no idea because at the time we used to get stick from the home fans. So we had no <laughs> idea who it was. Uh, but that used to happen quite regular, like doing shooting practice. And so, so facilities today... Um, you know, protect players, and and it's it's all about that. So, you know, the mental side of the game when they go into games, it's it's a clear mind. It's 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 a, co- a total clear space of what they need to do. How much did that affect you when you was playing, where you had um, home fans abusing you? Because you oh, can well, understand away fans, can't you? It's yeah, yeah. Part of the game. But. Well, for me, I always I always felt that City was a big club that either made your career or broke your career. And for me, I wasn't prepared to go to City and then say, I wasn't going to make it. Was there any hesitation going there with your United background? No, because 
I, I, because I had went to, well, one, I went to other clubs and I didn't play for United. I didn't, I didn't feel, feel that connection. Very thankful of the opportunity, but didn't feel that connection. Uh, and so many years had passed through. Um, so I didn't, I didn't feel that. But um, for me, I had, I had started using a psychologist and it was the best thing I ever done. Because it just made, it just took the pressure off of me thinking about as a player when I go and play, I've got to score. Because I can tell you, probably ninety nine percent of players, at all levels, as strikers, go into a game and just think, I've got to score. But there was a bit of a breakdown, you know, in in how we made me look at the game, and so that that weight and that pressure um, was just totally off my shoulders, and I just just went from strength to strength. I mean that. Um, some brilliant seasons, even, you know, like I said, 32 goals in the championship, getting us promoted. And then when we did get promoted, I was injured for the first uh, two and a half months, but still finished top goal scorer with 12 goals, having missed two and a half months mm. when he had brought in players like um, Anelka, um, George Ware came, but was there so, so short. He was only there for like two, three months. Um, so to still finish and miss two and a half months of the season, um, you know that I, I I feel proud about that. Um, the city fans did make you a cult hero at City. What's that feel like? And is there a moment that you go, these lot really fucking like me? Here. Yeah, yeah. It's it's. I think it was the journey that 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 we had, and the journey that they saw that I was able to, you know, come come back through that that challenge. Um, you know, I remember doing. We as as the club used to send players to do Q and A's at the supporters branches that that don't happen today, but I remember going to them and and you know the mic would be passed to to a guy and the guy would say, "Well, why are you so shit?" <laughs> and you you know, and he's like, "How how do you answer that?" Oh, uh, this so, is pre Twitter, everybody. Yeah, it it's pre Twitter. Yeah, <laughs> so that was that was sort of uh, some of the tough times in the journey I had to go through. You know, and and how I responded with it, it's like, you listen, you know, maybe I'm not the best player in your eyes, you know, but I just try to do the best job again for the for the for the team. And, you know, for maybe a game or two, I'm not a one, but for one or two other games, uh, I know I'll deliver. But to have that question thrown at you, that that just doesn't happen today. Players are just so protected. Um, And and I I don't even know how you answer. Why are you so shit? You'd be like, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right, mate. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that was that was, and and I think I built a rapport because I I I I faced up to that. I didn't, you know, because I because I'm why you, why are you having me go to this if they're giving me stick if I want the main guys to give and stick to, but faced up to it and just over time they started to see, uh, and the strange the funniest thing is for the five seasons that I was at the club, I finished top goal scorer in every season. So even my first season when we were getting, again, going to the gym to warm up rather than on the field, I finished with 21 goals, which was four goals less than what I normally produce in that, at that level, which was, um, which was League One. So I, you know, for me, I, I, got, I got through that. Um, but then when I started seeing psychologists the following season, I just, I just kicked on. Um, and just started scoring goals and scoring goals. And, and I think that's what, why the report is there. And, and they've seen the journey of, you know, even probably some guys saying, yeah, I should give him a stick, but bloody hell, you know, he's, he's the one that's producing. He's the one scoring the goals. He's <laughs> always scored the goals um, in, in vital games. So I think through that journey, that's where the report came. What was the difference for you in the level uh, as you moved up? Because you've obviously played in the third tier with City. Um, and your record didn't actually change that much. I think you scored well over 100 goals, didn't you, for, for City in only five yeah. years. Um, that's still prolific. And to be able to do that across multiple levels, I have to take my heart to that. Yeah. That's a brilliant achievement. But what did you notice in terms of the difference in playing at those levels? I think in the in the early years, a lot of it was, you know, we say crash band wallop, a lot of it was winning second ball, you know, get the balls wide, balls in the box. And so I I will go to a game and not know if I'll get a chance. And that's 
that's the unique difference with slightly better when you start playing a certain way with better players you know you can go to bed and go to a game knowing i'm going to get a chance or two aguero sergio know they're going to get opportunities i think there was there was probably a time united a couple of years ago i don't think your strikers knew they were going to get a chance mm. and so whilst it's easy to say he's rubbish he's not delivering he's work you know he costs x amount of millions I think some of that has to do with the manager and the style of play because you just can't say, well, I've put a 50 million pound player up top, but then we're just kicking the ball up to him in the air and he's five foot five and we're saying, well, why are you not scoring? You've, you've got to provide a way and a platform that, that allows him to showcase his abilities to get those opportunities. So the, the better players I played with, the more opportunities that I got because we played slightly different. Um, and... You know, I think one of the real turning points, certainly talking about the quality of players, a player named Ali Bernabia, uh, when he came to City, he, had, he, he was a previous French player of the year. And you obviously don't become French player of the year. You have to be some sort of player. And we had no idea who he was. <laughs> and I think Kevin Keegan had sort of nicked him from Sunderland because he was about to sign for Sunderland. And somehow Kevin Keegan had done a deal and got him. But this, this guy was phenomenal in terms of his technical ability, he, we started to play more rather than, you know, kick it, flick it on, get it wide, get in your box, you know, that, that style of football. It was, no, we're going we're gonna to play. And a lot of discussion was at the time, because Ayo Berkovic was another one that could play. And again, he weren't the player that you say, well, go in your 50-50s. He can get it done. And he was good at the 15, 20-yard passes, keep possession. So a lot of discussion was, will he sort of play those two in the team? rather than just playing one. Uh, and, a, and a few of the games, he played both of them, and we actually started to dominate a lot of possession. Um, not not to the degree that you see teams do today, but yeah. these these guys then started sliding balls in in my favor rather than I've slid you in, but still with the defender's favor, and I'm going to out-muscle him to, to get some sort of luck, so I, it becomes a chance. And I think that was... The, the, the change in terms of playing with the quality and the better, just playing with the better quality player because they think differently, they do things differently, their angles are different. Um, and so I just sort of rose to that because I'd always been a student of the game. You know, if, when I played against United, for instance, you know, I, I knew about Rio Ferdinand. I looked at Rio Ferdinand as to what's his strengths, what's his weaknesses, knowing that he's calm on the ball, he likes, he's, he's confident on the ball to come out. And my thinking is, when I get the opportunity, can I get around him? Because he feels that confident. Perhaps I can nick something that could create opportunity mm. for us or a chance for myself. So I was always a student of the game as to who I played against and what, what they were about. Um, I've heard Kevin Keegan didn't have tactics. Is that correct? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was really disappointed because, you know, for me, when Kevin Keegan became a manager, I was like, brilliant, you know. A top Liverpool striker, uh, England manager, so it was like a lot of boxes for for a Bermudian to be coached and managed under, and also a striker, so he can give me those finite sort of quality. But, but no, but no. <laughs> and Keegan's philosophy, I think, for me, in my time under him was, I got I got eleven good players on the field, and my eleven good players will find a way to be better than the other, the opposition. And I can see why when he played, you know, when he's manager of England and England played Brazil or Italy or one of these other top, top countries that he struggled because he didn't have that, that bit of nose or knowledge to say, we're going to do this tactically. That's going to really adjust the game. I'm going to move a player and do something a little differently. Yeah. Or mark this guy out of the game because he's the playmaker. He's the playmaker. Yeah. Nothing. No, just and go and play and so we always play outside. five sides, and he'll just say, "Players in my team need to want the ball. You got to want the ball." But it's you know saying you got to want the ball, but there's also a time when a player is in a bad position, and if you're giving it to him, then you're stitching him up. Yeah, and and so he never had the tactics to say, "This is how we're going to play." This is how he just say, "Every player in my team needs to want the ball." <laughs> I, I love that part about it, but he didn't give us the detail that you get with, with top managers now. You get that detail. Um, and you get that understanding of how the pitchers, how to play out, how to, when you're in the midfield, these are your options. 
uh, and, and then clever players can expand upon that. They're like, oh, those are my options. I could also do this. Yeah. And that will elevate that whole scenario. Um, so it was disappointing when, again, a top, a top striker, also England manager. So I'm thinking he's, he's managed the best in England. And I'm thinking I'm not going to get that knowledge um, to, to improve myself and, and obviously us as a team. But, yeah, it was, it was a little disappointing. So a lot of the games he managed, they were always the thing that happened in the last five minutes. So if you had a great touch or a great shot, the last five minutes was like, brilliant, well done, keep it going. But the other 40 minutes, you could have made a few mistakes. Now, likewise, if you came off the last five, 10 minutes and made two errors. You're the worst player. Right? You're the worst player. Um, <laughs> and so it was, it was never, and, and, you know, it was never solution-based. And, and that's what I learned from Keegan, that he never had solutions to situations other than the general normal stuff. Ronaldo, stuff like that. Yeah, you know, run, give it to him because he's got the beating at the fullback. Well, uh, uh, you know, if you understand watching the game with some chips, you're like, they've got to get it to the ringer because he's got the <laughs> beating of him. Do you, do you know what I mean? So it was nothing, it was nothing new or different that, that made me go that the one thing I would say what he was really good at is just saying that, you know, you guys are brilliant. I wouldn't want I any that. other player. Like, it gives you belief. It gives you belief, but the tactical side... It, for me, I was disappointed. Who was your, the best manager you worked under? I, it's funny because we, we nev- I never had a manager that was like the current managers in terms of the, you know, the knowledge of the game and the tactical nows and everything. But I would have to say, I have to say Joe Royal because... I was thinking it, Joe Royal. And, and, it, and, and the reason is because <clears throat> Joe Royal had the guts to stick with me when the fans were probably saying, no, go with someone else. So his belief in me made me want to prove him right and then it, it inadvertently, inadvertently proved the fans like to show them that actually he was right to make that decision. And then they started to support, you know, but this wasn't in the first year. This was going into perhaps the middle of the second season where they then started creating songs and realizing like, the history one that scores the goals. Yeah. It's not a bad song as well, to be fair. It no, no. I fucking hate it. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. Feed the girl. Nah. <laughs> I'm not singing it. <laughs> uh, how do you reckon you'd get on? Uh, do you think your style of play would suit this current City team? Yes. Because what I know, my strengths was, I knew where to be when the ball was in the final third. That that became my my niche, you know. My that's I knew I knew where to be when the ball was in the final third. Whether you know the defender has to go over two yards that way, so I also step a yard this way. And all I'm all I'm looking for is either that pass coming in firm enough that my first touch beats him, you know, or actually words ricocheting in and around the box for the from a corner. Yeah, I I just knew where to be. I could see situations and 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 see. I've just got to step out of this. It will fall right here, and true enough, it falls right in that area where I'm able to smash it in. Um, so when I look, um, when I look at this current city team, yes, because again, De Bruyne, the way he the way, the way he crosses when he's out wide, the way he gives through balls, he gives through balls now that. It don't really matter where the defender is. If you're on the same, if you got that understanding, you could still get those opportunities. So, um, yeah, I do feel, I do feel I can, I can play in the city team. And and then people may say, people may say, but that's a crazy statement. But I don't think it is. I, I, I because I see city well enough, enough to know that, you know, a lot of also what they do, attacking wise, is also coached I think back in the day coaches used to say well when you get to the final third you let the players express themselves but I actually think that a lot of attacking play certainly when I look at City there are things that are repetitive that lets me know for certain that they work on that oh yeah that to the full back to the player on the byline back to the penalty spot that's a City goal isn't it yeah, yeah you know where it's going to be and I'm sure if you're a centre forward you exactly. can anticipate that it's very seldom it's very seldom City will, will you know a player will get the ball let's say 
eight, eight, ten yards outside the corner of the uh, the eighteen yard box as a wide player, and you would get uh, a De Bruyne or Bernardo Silva that will make a almost a, a straight run towards the byline, and that that pass is very seldom not made because they also run on the back of their player. And what that means is the center back has to come out. Mm. And when the center back comes out, De Bruyne or whoever it is, flashes that ball across. That means the striker is now in the middle free because the other center back is on the, on the backside of the striker. So I see that happen so many times that I know. Because if you, I see it happen so many times. I know that that pass is never not made. It's it's almost always made, which tells me they work on it. It's just like when a team set up for a corner against and they go, they've always got a player that stood on the post. Well, that's that's worked on. He ain't stood there because he wants to stand there. And that's the same thing. So I see certain things that patterns that happen with City that's worked on. And I think that's where the game's evolved now, where the top managers coach pitchers even in attacking there's one player that might have the opposite trajectory to what you had didn't make it at manchester city he's Mm -hmm. gone elsewhere proved himself and i was looking at a move possibly to manchester united uh with Jaden sancho one why don't you think he was given the opportunity at city and two do you think he'd be a success at united um i think he wasn't given the opportunity because i think at the time City were just playing phenomenal football. City, wide players in, in, in Sane and in Sterling, um, even Bernardo Silva, these guys were just producing the highest level. <clears throat> so so from I guess from Pep Guardiola or Man City's point of view was, yes, you're good, but perhaps in, a, in another year and a half to two years is your time and we could start feed, feeding you in because the guys who are actually there – they're only 22, 23. Um, so I think, I think it just happened to be with Pep's eyes that the guys who I'm currently got are at the top of the tree. If you're saying there are white players better, you're probably saying, yep, Messi comes into the equation. Well, it has to be a Messi or, you know, or, or one or two other players. But these players were so at the top of their game. It was, it was difficult. And if anyone came out and said, Pep's a fool to not be putting him in would have been the only individual because the, the players were playing that well. So you could partially see from Pep's point of view why. But he, he, he also was one of those that needed to go out and play. And I think he's opened the, the eyes and the doors for other young players to think, well, if I'm good enough, yeah, let me go learn a different culture, learn a different way of playing, get games under my belt, get really good experience, Champions League and, and top level uh, league as well why not and he for me when I watch him he excites me I you know he's a, he's that he's that player that gets bums off seats it goes wide to him whenever you see him even in England it goes wide to him and fans just sort of stand up and it's like what's he gonna do because I really like him and I'd love him to come back to England because um one of the best players playing in the Premier League even if it's a United shirt for me I, I love the game and you know, I love the game, so even if it's in a United shirt, I want the best players to be playing the league because, again, at heart, I'm a student. So I want to see best players play against the best players, and I want to see how players cope with. So whether it's at United, whether it's at Chelsea, whether it's at Aston Villa, I, I want to see the best players playing here and the best managers. The... Uh the thing with Sancho when he was playing, I used to watch him, obviously, when he lined up against United in the 18s and stuff like that. You hold your breath when he gets the ball because you're like, what is he about to do? Because yeah. he was so lethal every single time he got it. Yeah, the, the, the guy is exciting. He's, he's, he's a really exciting guy. You know, he, he gets the ball, he runs at it, he asks questions. Um, it, again, and, and, you know, when I think about England, what an exciting time and period. I, you know... I, one of the things I said, well, no, in hindsight, Southgate being continued on with the new deal, I think was brilliant because he's now the new evolved manager. Uh, and now he's also got the quality and the talent to go with this thinking. Um, so Jaden Sancho, Sterling, Rashford, um, you know, uh, Hudson-Odoi, 
I'm, I'm trying to think. I mean, that Y position is it's, it's, it's ridiculous. Same as right back, right back, right back stacked. is stacked. And 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 if you got players like them, uh, it may seem you know this may seem weird with with being on a United program, but it almost suits somebody like Juan Basaka to be the right back because Asensio don't need nobody to go around him. A Sterling doesn't need no one to go around him. A Rashford doesn't need no one to go around him as fullbacks. Mm. If Rashford's playing on the left, then yes, he can have that. It's, it's great because we know he wants to come in uh, on his right foot. But essentially, if these guys are playing on their right side, they don't necessarily need a player going around them because they have that, you know, eight times out of ten, they go across the players. And if you've got a one Bissaka that's, that's behind you, for me, I think he's the best one-on-one defender. He's, he's got that mixture of that old-fashioned defending. And you would think someone defends like him would give up more penalties, but he oh, always gets if it. He, if he gives one away a year, it's well worth it. Yeah, it's well worth it. So I think he's, I think he's a quality defender. Um, I've seen enough of, of Sterling playing against him that at this moment in time, he's, he's definitely got Sterling in his pocket. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see the next two or three games when they play against each other because... If he's learning from it. Yeah. yeah. And I'm sure Sterling will, will, Sterling will be wanting to to change that because I I think it's an obvious that people see. There's not been many games that I think Sterling's played against him and got the better of him in the last two seasons. Uh, yeah, Southgate needs to make a massive decision on how he's going to play with this England squad because once he figures out how he's going to play I could see Trent and Harry Kane being a great partnership in putting balls in the box for him but if he decides to go with more of a false nine someone maybe like Sterling to play in the middle mm. uh, and finish chances off I think you go with an entirely different sort of system you're not going to put high balls in for Sterling are you? No, you're not, not at all and and, and the other thing as well sometimes combinations meaning players that, that play together uh, in the whole conversation talking about right backs Talking about Trent, talking about Wamasaka, I haven't even thought about Kyle Walker. Kyle Walker will have an understanding with um, with Sterling. So, so I know that combinations also work, or that understanding, you know. And I and I think when you think about England, someone like Harry Kane, I know we're drafted or, or drifted to to England, but Harry Kane, because he had that that relationship and understanding um, with Daly Ali, that that worked. Mm. But I. I think the pressure is on Delhi Ali now because the, the quality that's coming through is 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 coming fast. And he, he, for me, I think he needs to up his game foreseeable future between now and the end of the season for people to go, yeah, Delhi Ali should be involved in this because, well, he should be, but should he be starting? When I see some of the, the players that are producing at you know so many clubs, He's he's got a pressure. He's oh, got pressure Ma- coming. Madison and Trent should be both looked exactly. at well before him. Yeah, Southgate's got to be brave. I think he's got to be brave. Stick to his guns of what his style of play is going to be, mm. and what players fit that system better. Because I think the golden generation, the the Beckham, Gerrard, Lampard sort of era, it was too many of the big names got picked. Yeah, and perhaps Michael Carrick might have been a better fit for the team. For the team, yeah. Uh, and I think I can see us going down the same road again, where we pick what's so called the better players. And not necessarily the better team, and I think they'll they'll underachieve because of that. I think. I, well, I actually think he's aware of that, and I think he'll be the first to make those brave decisions. I think um, I'm sure it was him that made the decision when he had to ease Wayne Rooney out, which wasn't would not have been a, mm. a easy thing, you know. Top goal scorer, one of your, one of your best players, most experienced players, and to to go a different direction, you know. As, as we say today, go a different direction. Basically, it's just going with a, with a younger player that's that's got this energy and appetite um, that's also going to do everything you say rather than a Wayne Rooney who is world-class quality that may say, I don't quite agree with that, so I'm going to do 80% of what you're asking. The other 20% I'm going to do because this is, this is serving me good. Just throwing a scenario out there. So he made that brave decision. So I think he is he is the one that will have England playing one a, a really attractive brand of football mixed with the, the, the great determination, pace, uh, but also with that, that excitement, um, with that excitement. Because countries have always feared England. You know, when I've watched, they've always feared England. But I think England's now got a lot more flair about the game and the aggression. 
to, which is that that the British great to still see him through. So oh, I, think, I think this is a great period for. I, I won't be surprised if England go on uh, with the Euros and um, and also with the World Cup. I think in Rashford and Sancho, just those two alone, forgetting Grealish, Madison, yeah. Kane, Sterling, in those two alone, I think they've got people that are capable of winning matches. Yeah. And, like, literally just t- changing a game. Exciting players. Um, right, yeah. let's talk a little bit about this weekend's derby. <laughs> Sorry to be so Is short. it time for a commercial sure. break? Pay Actually. some bills? And you got to pay some bills now? Yeah, sure. We'd like uh, to thank uh, <laughs> who's our sponsors. <laughs> this is sponsored by The Athletic. Um, Daniel Taylor's done an article, which I'll throw a link to in the description. Uh, I'd like your thoughts on this. Um, he's reckoning City should ditch Otamendi the same way they did Dimakalis following uh, the Derby defeat. I, I don't think it was all on Otamendi this weekend. No, no. Um, City had a bad day at the office. I Listen, City's won things with Otamendi, with, Otamendi, with um, Mendy. Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't put... Look, there's, there's a couple errors that we've had from our goalkeeper that Addison has been... He didn't, Probably. Have, he didn't have a good game. Today. He didn't have a good game, but I, I would say that he's almost been near perfect in terms of not goals are not being conceded because of him. So when you when you have a game and and you drop three points because your keepers made one, he's probably earned the club nine, twelve points. So so I, for me, I would just take that one and say, yeah, Addison, Addison, we're in at it. Uh, at an off day, but I think this is when you have a situation like this, you start reaching and and calling out and saying, you know, player, this player, that player. Um, City had, a, had an off day, you know, var- had all the possession. Uh, I can't remember. I think it was something like seven shots where United had almost double. Um, yeah, seven or 12, I think it might have been. Something like that. Yeah, so, so whereas... That that's not city. Normally, it's somewhere it somewhere is reversed. So it just showed you that with all the possession in the final third, city did not produce, did not deliver, and I wouldn't say that was down to Mendy. No, I don't think it was. A, <laughs> so it's, so a, it's, call a strange Mendy, it's a strange. Yeah, I think he's just trying to draw lines with you know, what Rashford did to Dimakalis, uh, and then thinking that that's something that. Could but if you want to read it, I'll throw yeah. a link to that in the description. Um, you had quite a bit of success. I don't really want to do this. Uh, what's your memories of Manchester derbies? Um, my memories of Manchester derbies? Um, yeah. United were the yardstick. They were the team that everyone wanted to beat because they had all the success, they won all the trophies on a consistent basis. And so for me, playing against United and to prove that I'm as good on the day as, as these players, then that, that's what it was about for me. So... You know, um, I've, I've, uh, I, I think back to sort of um, the derby and Gary Neville with a great assist. Um, it was a great pass from Gary Neville. I'm not sure if everyone recalls this one. Look it up. No, no but um, <laughs> listen, I, I, you always got up for games. But again, because United were the yardstick, they, you know, the, the quality of football they played, the way they dominated, for me... These, you know, the little kid from Bermuda wanted to see just where are you? Where are you uh, on a level when you're talking about playing against these players? And and so I've always wanted to do myself proud, my country proud when I represent it, playing for my club. Um, so, yeah, great assist by Gary Neville. But I, I also take joy in, in the in the in the game that was at at Old Trafford. Came on as a sub uh, and scored in nine seconds. So I think it still stands as the, the, the quickest girl as a sub in the Premier. Um, and the funny thing was, I used to score goals against other teams and I always wanted to sort of do the celebration of like their most prized player. So scoring against Newcastle, I'd go and do the Alan Shearer celebration. <laughs> so when I was at, so when I scored against United in that, you wouldn't recognize it because it was on, it was on a set piece but I wanted to stand up and be like Cantona, right? Do a Cantona celebration. But I got mobbed so quick. And I was just like, gosh, I'm messing my celebration up. So if you look, you probably see my head sticking up. Like I'm trying to like do this, look around, like, you know, Cantona celebration. So I knew that that sort of winds, play, you know, winds that position up. But you might have just ruined my favorite celebration. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so, um, but yeah, it, would, it, it was it was just a privilege and a great time to to play against United because the best players, the tempo, the tactics, you know, the the aggression in the game, um, you know, the leaders, the never say die, you know, Gary Neville undoubtedly at the time was the best fullback. Um, and yeah, he, you know, I'd lo- I'd love to see him do commentary over that, <laughs> over that little piece of that mistake. Do you know what? But, Is that, have you been watching the soccer boxing that he does? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. really good. Isn't it's it? really good. Yeah. I, yeah, I wouldn't mind actually seeing that because normally it's him having a laugh at someone else's expense. And yeah, I wouldn't mind. That would be interesting. No, it's good. It's good. Fuck One day he'll invite me on. Yeah. We'd have a we'd have a little crack and some popcorn. I'm sure the <laughs> blue quarter of Manchester would probably really enjoy that. Yes. Uh, <laughs> the. Um, the future then for you, uh, you've currently just launched or just announced the launch of the Sean Goater International Academy. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Well, yes. I, I, I personally feel that in Bermuda we have some young, we have some young talent uh, ability-wise that can make it uh, in the UK, in England, whether it's League Two uh, and eventually moving on or whether it's non-league and eventually moving on up the ladder. Um, and I feel that what's needed is them to be here with, within an academy, but given given the right tools and me having had the journey myself you know i offer one or two things that other academies don't offer uh but primarily to help the young bermudians it's not only for bermudians it's also for the the, the local kids so what i thought, what i know is that the the young british kids uh what what they have in abundance is an aggression they have a, a never say die uh the bermuda kid will come with with ability but they wouldn't have that, that never say die attitude, that determination. And I think we, this is what I learned um, again from playing with with English players, British players, learning that, you know, roll your sleeves up and and really understanding that. Um, whereas the Bermudians, like, it's a bit cold today. Uh, I don't know. But, but being around that, training with that, being in that environment, you, you they'll then learn that. And I'm sure there will be some things that the you know the British kid, the, you know the kid from Manchester will will also learn from the Bermudian. Um, so yeah, I'm ex- I'm excited about this. Looking at this uh, for September launch and uh, having again this mixed fusion of local kids with, with Bermudians, I think could be a, a, a good mix as well. Awesome. And you also did a little bit of coaching, don't you? Are you currently coaching? Anna? No, I I again I was pursuing the coaching, wasn't really getting the opportunities, but. Again, I think this this allows me the opportunity. I have an A license. I have the ability to, um, again, I like to look at teams and sort of study, you know, what they do from uh, set pieces to playing out the back. Um, just just a student at the game. So I have the ability to to really stick to a philosophy and say, right, this is the this is the, uh, the way the academy is going to play. Uh, and, and, and I think... From my experience, players always want to be challenged. And and why players get bored at, at whatever level is because they know what's coming. And they know that the coach says, just go alone, knock it in the corner, you know, win the second balls and all that. Whereas if you have a way of saying, if a team plays this way, this is how we're going to play. These are your scenarios. You as a player, when you're on the ball, you know you've now got these two, three options. You can choose the best option because you've got ability and, and with your ability you can do that. And players like that sort of challenge. And and if they're not being challenged, they get stagnant and bored. And and I've I've had some managers like that. So as players, what you do is you just say, because players, you do know the answer as well. You know the answer because you're out there experiencing the scenario and the situation. Mm. You know, you know your player is dragging you somewhere, creating a space for another player, and you have the solutions. So um, I'm excited about this and uh, really looking forward to it. I will throw a link to that in the description as well if you uh, if you want to go and check out what he's up to. Uh, but Sean, thank you very much for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, if you guys want to check out more of what's going on with his academy, I'll throw that down there. Uh, and it says also brought to you by The Athletic, uh, as we mentioned. And if you would like to check out more of that and get 50% off your trial and your yearly subscription, link for that is in the description. But thanks for tuning in. Thank you again to Sean. Absolute pleasure. And uh, we'll, we'll see you in the next off. one. Blue Moon! <laughs>